I want to thank you for joining me today for this very first Tuesday in that season of Advent. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to gather before you for a time of Bible study. We pray that you would open up your word to us today. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I mentioned to you that this is the very first Tuesday in that season of Advent. So let's talk, first of all, a little bit of Advent. We are going to spend just a moment looking at the candles. What do they mean? Where does this all come from? For our first Advent. Advent, of course, is a four-week time of preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. So I'm encouraging you to do a couple of things during this season. Number one, listen to Advent music. You're saying, what the heck? I don't even know what Advent music is. I know you all are ready. You are so ready to do Christmas. You've been probably listening to Christmas since well before Thanksgiving. Just postpone that for a little bit. Well, listen to some Advent music. Get ready. So it's a time for preparation. So if your Christmas tree isn't up, it's okay. We don't get our decorations and Christmas tree up completely until... Probably the day before Christmas, Christmas Eve, because guess when Christmas starts? Hmm, I know you think it started already, based upon the commercials that you've seen. Oh no, Christmas doesn't start until December 25th. And then we have a 12-day celebration of Christmas, and then our celebration of Christmas extends into the season of Epiphany, which goes all the way up until the day before Ash Wednesday, what is also known as Mardi Gras. So if you're celebrating Christmas all the way until the day before Ash Wednesday, good on you, because you understand what Christmas is about. Christmas is a really long and beautiful season. Postpone your preparation or your celebration of Christmas. Listen to Advent music. If you don't know what Advent music is, I'm going to be posting some great Advent music here shortly that you will be able to start listening to and preparing your heart for Christmas and preparing your rooms and preparing your house and just take your time. Do certain celebrations. Don't light all the trees up or all the lights up now. Just take your time and go through a stage type of thing. We're going to wait until we get to Christmas Day for everything to be lit. How fantastic would that be? So we're getting ready. It's a season of preparation. Now, in the olden days, the color for Advent used to be purple. That's right, purple. So it used to be purple. But the problem was it took on the nature as a color of purple, the same nature as uh, Lent. And we wanted to distinguish that from Lent. Lent is a time of contemplation and, and angst and, and navel casing and repentance. And we said, well, Advent shouldn't have those same types of characteristics. Advent should be a hopeful season of anticipation. We're really excited about it. And so we changed the color from purple to blue. And so it is now huh, blue. There you go. The color blue, very a much warmer color, a color of hopefulness that hopefully will bring a smile to your eye to distinguish it from the purple of Lent. Now we have four Sundays of preparation for Advent, hopeful Sundays. Again, Advent music is just like that. It is such a hopeful, I find some of the Advent music so hopeful and happy and filled with anticipation and wonder about what God is going to do. And that's what this season is about. Now we've got these things called the Advent wreath. Where in the world did that come from? Most of us grew up with Advent wreaths in our churches or we know about them. It is a relatively new phenomenon. Well, I'm saying new phenomenon. It's only been like the last 50, 60 years or so that most churches have been using Advent uh, candles and Advent wreaths and so forth like this. So this tradition, again, was it came at about the same time that we decided that we would change the color from purple to blue for the season. There was a real liturgical revolution going on in the 60s and 70s. 
uh, throughout the world and rethinking about how we did our liturgy after thousands of years. And I'm sure there were some old crotchety folks who said, well, it was good enough for my mom and dad. It should be good enough for us. We should still make Advent purple and it should be still a season of repentance. No, no, no. We realized it needed to distinguish itself in some unique way. And so we added these beautiful candles. Here's the problem. The candles are a tradition looking for a meaning. And you might, in your church, every single year, uh, assign a meeting to each one of these candles. And you probably think, oh my gosh, it's been around for a thousand years. We have no agreed upon meaning for these four, four candles. So don't write me a nasty note and say, yeah, in my church, I know whatever your church is doing is absolutely fine. But there's no agreed upon meaning for each of these candles. It's too new of a tradition. We're coming there, we're getting there, but today we're going to look at a few of the different meanings that are assigned to that very first candle. Now, I would say that I think the one that probably has uh, got the most solid running for our tradition here is the word hope. This is the one that we actually use in our church. We assign the meaning of hope to that very first candle. And it's based upon the lessons that we read from the Old Testament and the New Testament, the hope and the anticipation that we have for the coming of the Christ. And so let me read to you from the book of Isaiah. It says, In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and the people shall arbitrate for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Thank God. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So the passage is telling us about what will come. And we are hopeful because we know the one who is promising this has the ability to deliver the goods. After all, the person promising us this is God. I love that phrase, beating our swords into plowshares. In other words, making wars to cease. We won't need swords anymore. We won't need our $10 billion or $100 billion or $50 bi uh, $200 billion uh, defense packages that we're putting together to create these weapons of destruction to protect us ostensibly, right? We don't need it anymore because God is in our midst. Love is with us. This is the hope that we look forward to. So this is one of the meanings that is often associated with that very first candle. It is not the only tradition that has begun. There's another tradition where we label this first candle as the candle of prophecy. Well, you just heard one of the lessons that we read for this very first Sunday. Um, boy, that kind of fits in there with that too, doesn't it? Um, but I like I prefer the word hope, I guess, for a very particular reason, because hope, it's all about our anticipation, our preparation, and how we are preparing to meet this coming Christ. Hope has to do with our demeanor, our disposition. Prophecy is kind of something outside of us. Prophecy is something that gives us the hope. This is the end game. This is just kind of the mechanism that gets us here. So I, I, I like the idea of hope being the meaning of that first candle. But again, there's nothing wrong with prophecy. Prophecy, by the way, is, you know, what makes the Old Testament go. There's a lot of prophecy that takes place. Even in the New Testament, there's a lot of prophecy. But let me tell you what prophecy is, and let me also tell you, first of all, what it is not. Prophecy is not primarily prediction. We all think that prophecy is about predicting the future and what's going to take place. Some of that takes place. 
in prophecy. When we read from Isaiah, it certainly seems like it's casting a vision of what God is going to do, and so there's a prediction of what God's going to do. But that type of prophecy is about this much of what we consider prophecy. The majority of prophecy is all about, really, are you ready? Truth-telling. A prophet looks at, well, okay, a prophet will look at your car and say, well, you know what, your lug nuts are loose, and, you know, and if you keep driving your car that way, your wheel's going to fall off and you're going to be in an accident. It's truth-telling. Your lug nuts are loose, and so that's a disaster coming. It's a truth-teller. Is he predicting the future? Well, that prophet doesn't actually know whether your wheel is going to fall off. Maybe you're going to run up to the gas station and get them tightened up, and fortunately you're not going to have that prophecy fulfilled because you took heed to the prophet's word who told you about your lug nuts being loosened. Okay? A lot of Old Testament prophecy is just like that. It's common sense. Treat your neighbor with respect, or else these are the consequences. Take care of the poor, or else when you are poor, there will be no one there to take care of you. These are, these are not predictions, they're truth tellers. They're telling you the truth of what is going to result from your behavior if you continue on it. You continue drinking, you will die because it will kill you. The alcohol will kill you and it will push away your family. You're a truth teller. You're not necessarily telling this person they're going to lose their family. You're telling them that these are the consequences that they continue down this path. The majority of prophecy is of this nature, a truth teller. On occasion, we have lessons where God gives us prophecies that have to do with the future. This will come. It's a promise. It's a hope in which we put our trust. And, oh, by the way, because it's promised by the Almighty God, we know that it will come to pass. Have hope. Peace is coming. It's just around the bend. That day when our swords will be beat into plowshares, where war will be no more, and we will all be in the presence of God. How does this happen? There's only one word for that, how that happens. It's Jesus. Let's pray. Grateful God, our great, our, we're grateful God for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ so that one day our swords may be beat into plowshares. May you continue to bless us with your presence. We know that you have already crashed in this world, but this vision of that future has not yet come to be. But until that time, that doesn't mean that we cannot be kind and caring and loving to one another because we have hope in Jesus. So we give thanks for this in your precious name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with hope in your heart. In Jesus' name.